Hello, it's me, Joe Valick, and I'm back with episode four of the Cotched podcast. Just a short intro piece today. I don't have too much to say. Uh, I just want to let you know I've got some other really cool interviews coming out very soon. Um, two that are almost ready to go. So make sure you're subscribed to me on YouTube uh, so you get to see them as soon as they come out. Um, anything else? That's about it on the updates. Let's jump straight into the episode. We're joined today by Max Scott. Yes, I went to school with Max. Uh, he was in the year above me and he became a events promoter uh, drum and bass, very big in the drum and bass scene. And I saw a post he did on Facebook recently, as we discussed at the start of the episode. And I thought, hey, why not get Max on the podcast? I'm sure he's got loads of really interesting insight and knowledge and stories from running events in the drum and bass community for over 10 years. And that's exactly what we talk about for about 45 minutes of the podcast. And then towards the end, we go into a little bit more of Max outside of drum and bass. It's a really interesting episode. Um, we, yeah, as I said, share lots of great stories and insight into what it's like working and living drum and bass. So, Cotched episode four. Hope you enjoy. Be sure to follow, like, subscribe, rate five stars on Spotify, all the usual things. See ya. That's a small world, really, drum yeah. and bass. Is like I mean, the prom promoting world community. is a pretty pretty small world, isn't it, I guess? Yeah. Cool. Well, let's start again. Hello, <laughs> here with Max Scott, um, not known as Mascot anymore. Not uh, these days, <laughs> yeah. To friends, I guess, but yeah, not uh, not professionally, I don't think. But for people who don't really know Max Scott, who, who are you? What do you do? Um, so I'm a freelance events professional. Um, I run music events up and down the country. Mm -hmm. um, a co-director for the boxing gym uh, down on Clement Street. Um, and work full time in music shows and have done for nearly ten years now. Wow! Yeah, it's uh, been a wild ride. I remember because we went to school together, and the reason I've got Max on is because I saw him posting on Facebook last week uh, looking for um, DJs to do a bog mm. event, and um, I was like an hour late, and I was like, <laughs> message you like, well, probably too late for the DJ set, but you should probably come on the podcast. Mm. I'm sure you've got some good stories to tell. Yeah, thanks for um, the uh, thanks for the invite. So, right, did you get someone to play? Did the event? in the end, yeah. So uh, it was pretty last minute um, as part of like a marketing uh, part of the marketing strategy for the Mungus Hi-Fi tour that I'm doing mm -hmm. right now. Get your tickets and. Um, yeah, it was fairly last minute trying to get the like support artists kind of put in. Um, like I didn't want it to be too bassy or too jungly or too drum and bassy, just because the sound of Mungo's is very like dub focused and reggae focused. You kind of want to set like a tone. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it kind of got to the day and was like, I've not confirmed anybody. So Shit. I know, yeah, it was uh, pretty pretty intense. Um, I yeah, can imagine you get like thousands of people. Yeah, well, when you kind out. of make a, I guess every promoter kind of gets it, especially when you're in in Bristol. Like, I think there was a running joke with like a guy called jo George Thoburn um, and Anton from Invicta. Um, I think when they were working at Lakota, and uh, I think George still does it now, but he'll post on Facebook um, looking for a DJ, and then like loads of bots will start to like. <laughs> So it ends up being like a 300 comment thread. Wow. Um, but, you know, everyone in Bristol. Engagement uh, baiting. Yeah, that's it. I mean, everyone in their nan is a Bristol in DJ. Uh, in yeah. Bristol, yeah, is a DJ in Bristol. Um, but yes, yeah, so I ended up having a friend of mine called Will do the opening set. He did like a 140 set. And then um, we had Tack from Exodus Records do a jungle nice. set. Because I was like, as much as I don't want it to be too drum and bassy, too jungly, like you kind of need to be in there anyway to kind of get mm. that. It's a Bristol sound, kind of keep the the audience engaged. Um, I think f like what the best part of two and a half hours of reggae would, I don't know, it might be a bit too down tempo. Especially in a toilet. Yeah, especially in a bog. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, Tack did the second set from Exodus Records. And then we had Rish Tafari, Rish Tafari who is the manager of Cozy's. Oh, cool. Um, she did like a pop infused kind of like bashment set i want to say uh, it was really cool and then we had feline which is a guy called felix um big on the festival circuit really great dude gets to the mic does like he raps to his own tunes or raps yeah, to the tunes while he's that he's mixing playing. yeah while he's mixing um just a really cool guy i met him years ago during the covid shows at the boxing gym the um socially distance event and then we had mungus hi-fi with aziza J, who was on the vocals for the first yep. half an hour and then gardner at the end and aziza's vocals are just insane you know yeah. even in the box 
dog. Like the acoustics <laughs> in there aren't like the most Not ideal, great. really. And you've got two monitors blaring at you. There's no like reference monitor for the for the MCs. Like you just cramped next to each other, and she just sounded amazing. Um, That's good. And Gardner brought the energy as he always does. He's got a very specific sound to his voice. Mm. It's so recognisable. So it's a good show. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. So thanks, uh, Danielle from the bog who organizes all the all nice. the lineups and stuff so thanks danielle big up yeah she was at sun and bass actually having a great time uh, yeah. and we were sending voice notes <laughs> to each other and all i could hear in the back was like dum -ch, dum -ch, dum. <laughs> she was like yeah max like, it's fine it's gonna sound great like yeah it was good yeah she's up I was going to say she's off on that. She probably wasn't. She was just having a lovely day. I think she's she just having the best time of her yeah. life. She's out with my friend Seb as well. Um, Seb's a Seb uh, Draper. And they were just having the best time of their life. Um, nice. Sun and Bass is like the best festival in the world as oh, well. Oh, it's a festival? It's a festival. Oh, yeah, it's in it. Sardinia. It's like the kind of oh, the wow. mecca of drum and bass. Um, that sounds good. Much older audience. Like the like average age is like... 28 plus I think um, maybe even civilized 30 plus drum and bass mm, I wouldn't say civilized I don't think civilized <laughs> and drum and bass go hand in hand uh, maybe with like really tame liquid sets but um, yeah it's not often you find it's not like cups of tea and mm. biscuits is it <laughs> <laughs> um, so how do you kind of cu curate a set or, for, or a night you know because I guess it's a lot of you want to pick artists that you like mm. but you don't want to like you say you don't want to just have one sound for the night because too much of one thing can get a bit boring mm. You want to pick DJs that are you know diverse and match each other. So yeah, how does it work when when you're planning something? So I think when you're kind of like choosing a night, um, there's either people who want to book events with headliners who are blowing up on social media, which is a legitimate form of doing events and stuff. It's what people want to go see. Mm -hmm. You're providing that artist with a space to bring them to a city that they might not hit before. Like you know, Fish Fifty Six Octagon, for example. Yeah. You know, he's been DJing probably all of his life. Got an insane record collection, um, but has recently blown up on TikTok. I think he left his job to... Yeah, he got um, full-time. Yeah, go full-time like DJ, and he's blown up on social media. He was at Glastonbury. Did you book various him? Festivals. I haven't booked him uh, myself, but the, the promoters um, from I think Pull Up, which is Pull a hard yeah. brand, they've booked, booked him. Um, so they've kind of gone down the route of it being fairly... Social media based, so people know who he is, going to mm -hmm. sell tickets. Badger as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Badger's killing it. Badger's such a nice dude as well. I met him years ago. We haven't spoken in a long time. Prison, no idea who I am. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we had like a long drunk chat um, at the nice. boxing gym years ago. Um, and then there's kind of the other side of it where you're booking quite headsy lineups, quite headsy shows um, that are kind of like Rob Britton from Central Warehouse and Alternate, his, his brand, does that really well. You know, curates a really great lineup. Um, that's really original. The sounds blend really well. Um, kind of really fleshing out individual labels, I guess. So like Exit Records, maybe, or um, or various other drum and bass labels. We can really, really flesh it out and dig deep with it to find like that quite headsy sound. Mm -hmm. But that in itself is quite challenging because you know you've got to find. You're not really reaching into like a student market, for example, or you're not. You're kind of not going for the masses. You're going for people who love that sound and who are a Go follower of that serious sound. Serious people. Yeah, yeah, yeah I guess yeah. I guess that's right. Like kind of serious people. Like Rupture, for example, has a really great following with that. Like you do a mm -hmm. Rupture show in Bristol and it sells out like that. But it's because it's a much older audience who may not go out that much but want to go and listen to proper, proper jungle. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, so Rob Britton does that really, really well, but it's it's tough because you know you're not appealing necessarily to the masses, mm. and he's got a massive what like twelve hundred capacity space, fourteen hundred capacity space, might even be more mm. to to fill to to make yeah. the money back on those shows. So, mm. you know, you've got to find a balance, I guess. With that, yeah, you've especially got to find as a the, the owner of a venue. Yeah, yeah, it's tough. Well, I guess when you're kind of the owner of the venue or the co-director in my in my. Um, in my situation, I don't own the, sp the the building itself. It's um, a charity by day. It's a building that was built in the 80s, um, run by Brist. Well, I think it's run by Riverside Youth Project and Broad Plain Boys Club, and Dennis Stinchcombe, who's been running it since, since day dot. I think um, an absolute Bristol legend. Mm -hmm looking after like kids in the community. Um, so it's a youth centre by day, uh, the boxing gym. Um, and then we uh, work our asses off to turn it into a <laughs> music event. It takes about three days to build properly. Wow. And then we try and rush it down in about 24 hours to get everything stripped down and back to normal, get it deep cleaned and everything. Um, but I guess when you're kind of curating a night itself, um, if you've got like your headliner, say your headliner is um, a big jungle dj or like a dub and reggae dj you want to try and find your support lineups that complement the sound of the headliner i disagree with this idea that you know the support the the dj on before the main headliner has to really tone it down turn themselves down really it's like if you're a headliner and you get paid thousands of pounds and you're being outshone by you know a dj a local dj mm-hmm 
like you're not worth the salt you know, you're not worth your salt so yeah. <laughs> i think there's a level of respect that you have to kind of you have to bear in mind um when you're planning your set if you're kind of like the support headliner dj the one just before the headliner um but you kind of want to curate the the the, the event sonically to make sure that it runs smooth and mm -hmm. people are kind of fixated in it they're engaged but they're not overwhelmed straight away they're not burning themselves out straight away it's, mm -hmm. so it can be it can be quite tricky trying to find the right sound and even if you book a dj give them a really long brief Right, look, this is kind of the sound we're going for. This is your audit profile. This is how many people are probably going to be in the space at that time. And they just go the complete opposite way and just play really heavy jump up. And you're like, oh, why have you done this? <laughs> like, but, you know, if people are into it and they're re reading the crowd, yeah. then who cares? You know, That's true. Yeah, well, I was speaking about this um, with Belters when I went on their podcast, um, talking about how I had always imagined it to be a lot more, uh, a bit like you said, like give, you're given a brief and you need to sort of play that style of music, that, you know, tempo range in the set. And if you're not, then the promoter will kind of come and tell you to change your set. But mm. um, from my experience, that hasn't really happened to me. And Beltis was kind of agreeing. Um, have you ever had to kind of go up mid set and say, can you tone it down or? Tone, no, tone I really wish I had a story for that. But no, I've, I think um, I think I've been pretty good in the way that I've been able to kind of craft the sets. I mean, there, there have been sets which I won't mention. I feel that's calling some, someone out. Yeah, you don't but need to name names. No. Um, Unless and you want to. Then. No, no, not <laughs> at ahead. all. Yeah, career over. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I had a really clear idea of what their sound was going to be because they historically play that sound. Mm. But um, maybe I wasn't clear enough with the brief, but I thought they were going to do like 160 Jungle um, and they just played like really heavy drum and bass um, before. like, And they were the opening set and then the next set was basically the headliners on for multiple hours, I guess. Um, and I was just like, oh no, I was sitting in the, sitting in the crowd and I was just like, I went bright red in the face, but you know, how, how do you like pull some, someone aside when they're mid flow and mm. just be like, turn it down, you know, yeah. like stop. I mean, I should have maybe, but, um, I enjoyed the set. Um, I guess the audience did as well. So you that's know. the main thing. As long as the, All's DJ, well that the ends DJs well. and the crowd are having a good time. Though. Yeah, exactly. And I was having a good time as well. So, and you're still, you're still in, you're still here. I'm still here. Exactly. Yeah. I'm still kicking about. <laughs> yeah. Um, I wanted to also talk more on um, actual like promoting mm. events as well because uh, I've been part. Of, I haven't really done much of it, but I've been part of little events that we promoted. And you know, when I'm playing, I just kind of do an Instagram story or yeah. a post or two about it. Um, but when you're running loads of events like that, it's obviously a, a way bigger um, deal. Yeah. And you've got to sell tickets. You've yeah. got to get people through the door. What does that kind of look like? It's especially? a fucking minefield. Yeah, yeah, I have no idea what happened to that. Honestly, like I've been lucky enough to be at a point now where I can like work with marketing teams who mm -hmm. kind of specialize in that. And even then, it seems like they'd have a fucking clue half the time what's going on. <laughs> um, like it just everything changes so quickly. I remember the days when I first started doing Rhythm Records, which was the first ever yeah, um, well, like I event. That name. Yeah, I know. Right. I was I was like freshly 18, first year of uni. I was like, what's the best way to spend my student loan that I pay my rent with? <laughs> Let's run a drum and bass event. Um, and it, eventually, it, well, it turned out really good and like, sold out the first show and gave it a really good platform. Um, but those are the days where you launch the event on Facebook and then you can invite everybody. You can invite like 2,000 yeah. people, your entire yeah. friend list to, to, to it. So it got really good reach really quickly. And I guess when you're in a city where you're booking the entire lineup, apart from the headliner, our local acts, you've got such a massive reach. And, mm -hmm. you know, I find I found that when I was working in Cardiff doing those shows years ago, it was a bit of a vacuum because it was a niche genre in a fairly small city um, and was the the support lineup. So some of them were from Cardiff, some were from Barry, some mm -hmm. were from Panath. So you were kind of able to get a really big spread really easily. But now it's just changed so much like meta is just such a minefield and you need to introduce TikTok and reels and I sound like an old fucking man, but <laughs> I just can't, I can't get my head around it. It is um, complicated. It um, did seem to be easier with Facebook events. Mm. But that's where I used to find all the stuff. Whereas yeah. now there's so many websites to look at. Yeah. And used to literally just go on events like this weekend. Yeah. Okay, that looks good. That looks good. Should we go to that? Yeah. 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 Say yeah. I'm going, buy a ticket. It's just so Bang. tough. And I guess, I guess it's a combination of there's so many more promoters now. There's so many mm. more grassroots promoters definitely not a bad thing it's a great thing you know the more the merrier really um but just trying to advertise and promote these shows it can be so you can get really lucky like you know you put one post up and it just gets shared everywhere like it was like that with the first ever among us hi-fi and friends show i did a couple of years back at the o2 bristol same with the animax show we did animax before midnight so it was the very first launch of the project and i'd emailed her agent 
when it when she'd made and a news article to come out about this new project before midnight, mm-hmm. which is tailored around um, the show is for those who have kids who want to be at home oh, before yeah, I midnight. Remember this. I remember this. Um, and I emailed the agent like really like, yeah. hi, I love you, <laughs> please. And he was like, whoa, 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 Max, chill out. Like, we don't even know if it's going to go well. So they did the first one in, in London and it went really well. So I was part of the first three or four shows mm-hmm. um, to, to launch the project. And I remember like made the post and it just went everywhere. Every time I opened my Facebook, everybody was sharing it. And I just saw like loads of stuff. So I got really lucky with that. Went to bed. So it was supposed to go on sale the next day. Um, went to bed. I woke up. It was on sale at 10 a.m. It was like 10.01. Refreshing. I was like, there's nothing. Like wow. no no ticket sales. 10.02. All the tickets are gone. Like what? Like 1,600 tickets <laughs> are gone in the space of like half an hour. Wow. And I was like, because I kept refreshing it. And I was like, this is too much. And you have to allocate so between Skittle and working with Ticketmaster, boo Ticketmaster, um, <laughs> that you have to give them a certain allocation. So it's like 60% of all your tickets for them to sell through Ticketmaster. And I was like furiously t- like emailing the box office manager at the O2, Ben, who's a great, great guy. And I was like, I need more tickets. Give me more tickets. He was like, Max, I can't. I was like, please. Um, but yeah, so you can just get really lucky. Um, and I guess you could have a really well thought out promoting plan um, and it just doesn't land or it re- lands really well. I think at this point, it's a bit of luck of the draw. Mm. That might be wrong. I suck at marketing, so it might be wrong, but that's my experience. Some shows just sell themselves. Like yeah. if you bring the right headline or you've got the, the right lineup, then you don't need to do anything. Mm. Like in the Annie Mac case, you've made one poster, made one Facebook post yeah. and then that's it. It just went everywhere. Whereas yeah. some you can probably spend hundreds of pounds on adverts and getting it here postering and then mm. there's 50 people it's just so, yeah so and i guess there's so much kind of coming back to my point earlier about this being loads of new grassroots promoters like all the way from grassroots promoters to really well established conglomerates and massive corporate companies like you know live nation um dhp uh we're in the drum and bass we're like worried about henry drum and bass all stars um it's just so hard to compete when they have exclusivities and all these artists and mm. It gets it gets really tough, and they've got massive marketing budgets, and they've got access to ma- like premium media teams and people who've been in the industry for years and years who just know how to do it. Whereas mm-hmm. you know, you've got Harry seventeen or eighteen in Bristol trying to yeah. launch his first night, and it's like how how do you compete? I guess. But you did it. I did it in a different time, though. That's it was funny. only eight years ago, and my situation was very very different when I first started because um, I launched Rhythm with Leveler. And then didn't really have much of an uptake. And then I ran into David Shaw, who runs Concrete Junglists. Mm-hmm. I've actually got a Concrete Junglist tattoo. Just Big up. If you can see it on the camera. But, Is that uh, the guy with the funny glasses? <laughs> that's the guy with the glasses, yeah. <laughs> that's the guy with the glasses. Um, and cool guy. Cool glasses, very, too. Yeah, very cool glasses. Cool, yeah, cool dude in general. Um, and he used to run a show in uh, Club Before Back um, yeah. and ran it there for, I think, probably like a decade um with Cooley and a few others and um they just would sell out every time and then they had this one show Chrissy Chris back to back sub zero some some shit happened like not I can't actually remember what happened something happened they couldn't do the show anymore they weren't part of the um they they weren't allowed to do the show in the venue but I'd run into David Shaw maybe about 3 weeks earlier at Hospitality in the Dock in London and we spoke about it and I, t- I was really keen to like, you tell now, I'm still really keen about this whole thing. And he messaged me maybe a week later and was like, hey man, so I know that our shows are clashing. I've put forward my show um, a week to kind of give you the best opportunity to sell some tickets. Mm. And no one ever fucking does that. No one does that. No one, no like major promoter in your city will be like, I'm going to move it back for you because I, you know, I want you to do the best, yeah. that the best they possibly can do. And I was like, dude, that's crazy. That is crazy. That's respect uh, as well. Yeah, I'm like big up for that because they weren't allowed to do their show. So everybody who had tickets to that show then bought tickets to my show. And it was mm. the first time a drum and bass show had happened in Kongs, level two, the back room of Kongs. And it was the start of my career, basically. It was the, mm. the first idea of uh, my first experience, sorry, of running my own shows and promoting, I wow. guess. So, yeah, crazy. Kind of... Um... I think people underestimate how um, big drum and bass is and mm. what at least was in Cardiff and how uh, important it kind of was to the genre because growing up well, from like 14, you know, um, mates who were older DJing at Aperture mm. and Undertone and um, 
which was in Aperture. Uh, sorry, Aperture was in Anthem. But yeah. DJing there and uh, hearing about all these things that I couldn't go to. But it was just such a thing then. And I feel like it doesn't seem to be as big in Cardiff anymore. Yeah, I think... Because some clubs closed and nothing really replaced it for a while. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sad to see Undertone go. Like, I loved it <laughs> and it was a good place, but it was it was gross. Like, yeah, it was you know, it, you, it wasn't an Undertone night if the floor wasn't an inch thick of toilet water because the toilet would basically overflow every single... <laughs> and the toilet door didn't lock. So, like, it was just... It was it was an interesting, but it gave a lot of people an opportunity to play. Mm. So that's the thing that I respected about the venue for sure. But it wasn't a great space, was it really? Not but really. then obviously, club for back, like they didn't allow drum and bass in their venue for a long time um, because of X Y Z, and then they did, and then some shit happened, and then they kind of stopped. And um, like Kong's level two doesn't really do shows anymore. District, which is a new venue that's opened, yeah. um, they seem to be really going at it for it, which is you know good for them. It's quite and big, it, isn't it? Yeah, I think I think I, I'm yet to visit. I mean, a shame, like ashamedly, I've not I've not actually popped my head in just yet. Um, but I think the guys are doing really well with it. Mm. Um, and I know um, Will from d and All Stars, director of d and All Stars, used to start off running Canopy um, at the vaults. And I think he was their booker for a long time, their calendar manager. And um, he's got a Canopy show in um, in District, which is really good with AMC and Phantom. I feel wow. like I'm bigging up his show here. <laughs> Buy your tickets. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I agree with you that it's not as big as it was. Mm. Like it used to be the multiple nights happening at the same time. It was very competitive. I think having big nights at Bedlam, at the Student Union, mm. like their big... 4,000 cat mega rave and stuff. Oh, wow, was, was I'm not sure if they do shows that much anymore, Bedlam at the studio. I was think, literally thinking about Bedlam yesterday. I was thinking, do they still exist? I don't think so. Like, because they've been going for years and years. Like, mm. I thought they were a new brand, but I was just naive and didn't really look too much into their history. But they've been going for years, well before I even knew what Drum and Bass was, I think. But, you know, the Vaults was like a big thing. I'm a, My first ever rave was at the Vaults, and I was. Wow. 13? I never went. Or 14? I always heard just about the sweat dripping off the oh, scene. That's all I dude, know. Dude, you'd hold your it. pint and then you'd like just see drips <laughs> of sweat from the roof. It's like, yeah, ep- extra roughage, I guess. But um, yeah, it was gross. But it was great fun. And, mm. you know, I was like 13 or 14 the first time I went there. It's under new management now. So, you know, they, they're definitely have a lot, a lot better at spotting because i looked 14 mm. i stopped looking 14 last year so <laughs> you grew a beard, i grew yeah. a beard yeah now i don't get id which is really sad all my gray hairs coming through but um yeah so i remember the first night i ever went was um dj markey i think wow. and then because they used to do, do upside down scratching yeah 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 that like, must have been crazy when you were 13 to see that like, Whoa! <laughs> um and then because i used to go i used to go once a month then because they used to have Oh, what was it? It was like the drum and bass on the Friday and then Cellar Door on the Cellar Saturday, door, yeah. which was like the, the tech, House of Techno one. Mm-hmm. I think that's right. Or maybe it was Cellar Door on the Friday and Catapult on the Saturday. Maybe or vice versa. Either way. Um, and I saw like Calix and TB um, doing a six deck set at the vaults. <laughs> saw, um, who else did I see? DJ Markey, Calix and TB. Uh, just loads of like massive artists that was like, really really Ed Rush so oh. there's a photo of me and Ed Rush he's got this massive kind of like similar to the signet ring and I'm re- le- uh, leaning over the decks and he's leaning over as well and it's kind of like that photo of it's like, like, like the garden yeah, it's yeah like, where they're like passing the like, thing, back to, yeah. yeah it literally was just like that um, tried to recreate that fabric and he told me to fuck off <laughs> <laughs> So I, I, could, I, was, I was stood there like this for ages and he was like mate fuck off a really nice guy though I got to work with Ed um, at uh, was it 25 years of virus um, at hospitality on the beach on the um, Olive Grove stage I was the stage manager for that and um, amazing like maybe it was 20 years of virus or 25 years of virus and it was just so much fun and their special guest was Coven or Coven and she's just phenomenal. Like, mm. d- does live vocals over her um, over her set, and there's the energy. And it, she likes to get stand on the decks, mm. and, well, not literally on the decks, but on the de- on the DJ riser, and um, and she's very energetic. Like, just an insane talent. Um, but the Olive Grove stage, just ha- we had like a roof, so she's like trying to like crawl through the <laughs> thing, and I ran round and was stood on the mojo barrier, like stood there like this, just in case she fell over and stuff. But yeah, yeah s- such a great show. It's Ed Rush and Ups called doing a um back to back and it was just yeah really really good fun so mm. yeah they're great we grew what up was your question <laughs> just about cardiff yeah about cardiff. Base in cardiff and yeah. how um yeah it changed um but it's coming back hopefully mm. um you don't ju- well maybe you do do drum and bass at green man but i was gonna say you don't just do drum and bass because you do some stuff with green man as well yeah which is probably more 
a different kind of mm. thing. Yeah, uh, Green Man audience is very like BBC Radio Six audience. Mm. Um, uh, so I've worked. You with never Greenman. know anyone on the lineup, but you go home and you're like, these are sick. Yeah, I, I love find all new talent every single yeah. year. Yeah, find a new band that you just fall in love with, which mm-hmm. is probably one of the like m- most unique elements about Green Man. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, there's, there's loads of them, but I think people say that often that they don't really know that many people on the lineup. And that's not why you go either. No, no, you go for the go for the atmosphere. It's always it's like just really kind and fun. The production value is like incredibly high. But I worked with Green Man for eight years now. He used to be a wow. buggy boy, so really? I used to just drive the buggy. I used to volunteer and get a ticket and you know get fed well. And um, and then I moved from buggy boy to their operations team. So I was an operations assistant with Nush. And Alex Lane. So Alex Lane is like a really good friend of mine. He was my mentor for a long time. Um, and uh, yeah, got to show, they showed me how, uh, what the operations is like for a, for like a massive 25,000 people festival. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, so I worked with them for two years in that capacity. And then the job came up to be the settlement manager, which is the settlement runs three days prior to the main festival. It's kind of like a pre-festival festival, 5,000 people. So you can stay for like seven days. Right? Yeah, yeah, so it's yeah, like yeah. family holidays, basically. Um, but the audience is like kids and parents and, you know, it's not drum and bass, like, you know, <laughs> gun fingers. But they do actually love a bit of drum and bass. I have done like I did a DJ set last year and they loved it and they, wanted to, they didn't want it to end. It was at like 2 a.m. and I was like, guys, I've got to call it. But um, yeah, so for that, I kind of program um, the, well, I produce the area. So book performances, um, like storytellers, acrobatics, um, like bilingual workshops, um, it's like circus performers. Um, there was a crazy golf, uh, like kind of crazy golf course this year, which is really fun. Wow. Um, and yeah, it's a lot, you know, I spent a whole year doing it and it's like three days f- full of stuff to keep people engaged mm-hmm. and just have that variety. And then we have like homegrown Welsh talent in the evening who's, uh, like do their music performances, like bands or, or vocalists and stuff. And it's great. Mm-hmm. It's really good fun. This year I was able to book a Q and a and a performance with the Welsh ballroom community. Okay. Um, so ballroom started in the eighties in New York. Um, it's if you've ever seen the show like Vogue, for example, or Pose. I think it's called. It's called Vogue or Pose. Maybe Pose. Um, the musical. And, no, so it's like a it's um, a it's a show that I don't know what TV network it was, but it, it talks about the life of trans people mm. in the eighties. Oh, yeah. um, I haven't heard of it, and it's really really good. It's a really good show. Um, I feel like it's fairly accurate to kind of the history of it mm. but again oh, so it's like a not a documentary like no it's it's, it's it's like a dramatized okay. show really engaging um and um and ballroom effectively was a space for people to go to compete in different categories mm-hmm. so it might be um like face like you know or um it'll be like voguing or some form of different category. It's expanded massively now. Mm-hmm. Um, but the Welsh ballroom community is the first one in Wales. So wow. they've got lots in London or in Manchester in the major cities, but the first one. Um, and so it's uh, started by a guy called Leighton, uh, Leighton War, who's an absolute legend and his, his lovely family. Um, cause they all call each other family. Cause that's kind of, that's exactly what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and they did a Q and a about their history and, you know, their experience of being, um, queer and um, or being trans or um, or queer and trans and it was just great and you know I thought that audience wouldn't be as receptive to it it's a you know white middle class audience mm. but they loved it and were Very asking liberal, though. yeah well fine. they're asking engaging questions mm. and not questions that were like self-fulfilling it was questions to further their understanding mm. and then they did a performance um, at the end the, the pictures are just incredible we got a full <laughs> catwalk out like a 14 foot wow. catwalk it was great. It was really good fun. Do you have any involvement in, in the comedy side of things? So I actually booked some comedy this year. Um, we did a comedy. Last year I worked with a guy called Chris Curley who runs Buffalo Belly Laughs uh, in Cardiff. There's a venue that used mm-hmm. to be called Buffalo. I, think, I don't think it exists yeah. anymore. Yeah, like, yeah, I went to one or two. Bump and Grind they used to have a mm. Buffalo. <laughs> That's it, bump and grind. Terrible night. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty bad. Um, I think they're still active though, so I don't know if we can. <laughs> I don't know if we can say yep. that. Good fun if you're like eighteen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's horny. it. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, so Chris uh, programmed the family comedy and the adults comedy uh, last year. Wasn't able to do it this year, so I worked with a guy called John. Um, who books all the comedy mm-hmm. for the main festival? Um, a lot of the stuff in Babbling Tongues, which is the um, kind of talks and comedy 
tent, basically. Yeah. Does, he's one of the best in the country for booking talent. Um, and he really saved my ass as well because... <laughs> For whatever reason, like I was the the comedy that we'd originally planned fell through, um, and we kind of swapped the days over. But yeah, so the comedy stuff for the main festival is run by John and does a great job. Really lovely human being as well. It's very, it's a very interesting thing to have at a festival, and it just um, from when I've been to Green Man, like it's always like a, a great place to go if you need to chill or mm. you just kind of um, want to do something a bit different, a bit quieter, mm. have a sit down mm -hmm. maybe go and laugh and yeah I've seen some great stuff I think we saw Josh Whittacombe there one year oh and nice it was um, like absolutely packed like you couldn't we sat at the front and then it's like we can't leave now <laughs> we're here because if we we can't possibly get out of it here because it was the seats were filled and it was just like such a um, like something you don't expect from like a music festival but mm. it just is a really nice touch and I yeah I think they've really that. like nailed it on the head there their niche and you know it's through blood, sweat, and tears. Like they've mm -hmm. they've fought their asses off to make that festival what it is now. Yeah. Um, and you know, I've been lucky enough to be brought into that circle um, with uh, the you know the owner Fiona, who's the only female owner of a large scale festival, the only one in the UK. Really? Yeah, um, and she's that. worked her ass off to yeah. make that place what it is now. Um, and Nush and all the office team, so Adam does the marketing. Uh, Rosie is like uh, the executive assistant, um, and Ben, who's Fiona's son, who books the lineup. Mm. And it's just, you know, it's a really and Beth does all the logistics. Like it's a really small office team mm. that work with an incredible bunch of managers who I'm very lucky to be part of um, and we just love it we're well looked after the vibe is always super high it's just the most beautiful site in the UK or at least one of them mm. um, for a festival in like the Welsh Hills and Brecon Beacon yeah, um, oh is it Banai Brecheniog is that what it's called now yeah it's yeah. It's Banai Brecheniog to so um, back to the Welsh name that's it good yeah and uh, yeah it's a great thing but it was quite an, it was quite a um culture shock or maybe a shock to the system when I was you know starting to program the settlement area and my history has been running scatty drum and bass shows <laughs> or big you know large scale club nights yeah. so trying to tailor that to kids and families was yeah. a challenge but I think we've got there I mean it's my second year now hopefully be invo invited back for the third Mm. see what happens I guess change the vibe from people taking pingers to people <laughs> drinking white wine out of a box you know? yeah that's it I mean some of the parents do go quite hard because they're <laughs> like yeah we'll take it in turns like after the kids it's my night tonight you see them an hour later and they're like you know but uh, yeah as it's they good. should as they should yeah good for them yeah right? exactly yeah you're working hard raising kids it's not easy I mean I've not got kids but it's not easy no, is it definitely yeah not. yeah yeah um, I was going to ask you and I hope you don't mind me asking this but um, I'll ask you now as soon as you mentioned it mm. but um you are gay. I How dare you? No, yeah. Because yeah. Uh, I knew that anyway, but I just saying, I assume because I haven't seen you for years and I didn't want um, yeah, to get that wrong in case yeah. you suddenly were no longer gay. Yeah. Um, but have you ever felt like you face many barriers in the drum and bass community as a gay person? Mm, I think th that definitely exists um, 100%. Um, there's a guy called Toby Nathan, a person called Toby Nathan who runs Unorthodox, which is the uh, largest... Um, or at least the most prominent queer drum and bass brand. Mm. And he's done bits to get that out there to try and break down the barriers. And he's done a really good job of that. And I would, you know, put that down to him of how much that he mm. has A, had to endure very publicly on social media threads and online for merely existing or for merely putting up like a very fair liberal, like well, it's not even liberal, like a very fair normal comment, like, um, or caption or video or something. Um, so the, the internalized homophobia within drum and bass absolutely does exist. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think drum and bass has come on leaps and bounds. It's a lot of, still a lot to go for sure. But, you know, from where it was when I first started to where it is now, it has got better. That's good. It's still not all the way there, but it is. Uh, for me personally, I think I felt like I had to work 10 times harder to get my voice heard. Like, um, I wouldn't say that I'm like straight presenting. Like, I, I, I guess the way that I am... Maybe it isn't too effeminate, but it's not really like masculine. I'm very much just who I am and I don't try to be anything else. Mm. But I think that land landed a lot better with the male headliners who were trying to book and they felt a bit more comfortable doing this. So I guess there was an element of me having to mask who I was a little bit and try a bit more straight, a little bit more like masculine mm. to kind of have my voice a little bit heard. Um, and I think I kind of wanted to prove a point that 
I'm a gay, proud gay man who can do this as well. So, you know, I lived and breathed drum and bass and rhythm records, and like it was my entire life. And you know, I was like, I need my I need my voice to be heard so that I can create a space where you can be anything, you can be anyone, you can come to my nights and you can be safe and you can be happy. Toby Nathan's taken that a complete step further and it's really broken down that boundary for a lot of people um, in so many different capacities. So um, for me personally, not outright homophobia. Like I've never been assaulted on a night out. It's not from my nights anyway, or not from a drum and bass show. Um, but, you know, there was always that kind of like twinge. You could see people like, you know, Mm. kind of like squinting the eyes and be like what's this guy's deal and i was mm. like nothing i was like i've got no deal i just like men like yeah <laughs> you know what i mean yeah, like, that should be fine and it is fine yeah it's like yeah um but a lot of dance music is like it, it promotes a lot of like one love one family equality mm, very plur then, isn't it yeah. yeah um but um you know as a straight man it's never you know you see a lot of um people being their true selves when you go out mm. in waves and um especially living in bristol um you see that and it's very accepted here but um mm. i think we're spoiled in bristol yeah um, and like you've obviously done shows all over the country and uh, audiences vary from place to place and i think um yeah, it's a really interesting insight yeah it's i think it is tough like you know what i've had boyfriends that we've gone to raves together we've like dj together but there's always been that kind of thing of like like can we kiss here like can we like mm. hold each other's hand and you know for like straight people it's just so like you know they're like snogging each other's faces off <laughs> for you know like really getting hands on with each other at the rave and that's great you know mm -hmm. you live your life but i mean i'm not necessarily a massive like pda person anyway so it's not that i'm like because i don't want to see that I yeah who it is, to be <laughs> i don't care who it go is ahead. i don't really go want to see that so i'm corner. not saying i really <laughs> want to snog someone in the dance like it's not what i go to race for mm. yeah, i go to race for the music have a dance and stuff but it's the point is like I want to be able to feel comfortable with my partner mm. um, and I want people to feel like they can just they can be who they are and have the same level of mm. um, respect that everybody else has, especially the straight community has within within that space. Um, but I think it's got better like it has got a lot better. And um, but, you know, I could be wrong. Like, you know, I go to I go to a lot of my friends nights now or I'm kind of on the other side of it. Like I'm working shows more than actually attend shows these days. Mm. So I kind of and I do deal with with problems like you know venues that i work up in london or various other places when i'm when i'm looking after shows like but people come up to me and be like this guy's been really homophobic or the security person's been really homophobic or um you know they're not listening to me and i feel like they're ignoring me because i'm gay or because i'm trans or mm. for xyz reason and so it, it definitely exists i'm not saying just specifically within drum and bass it is it's prevalent everywhere um but um but yeah i i guess it's it's it, it's moving in a direction mm. i think hopefully for the better i think that's good to hear i've got one more question about that but first um are there any nights or events that you want to shout out that are good for yeah so i've got the mungus hi-fi tour so it's mungus hi-fi and friends um tour which is coming up in the next few weeks we've got manchester on the 27th mm -hmm. um of this month we've got um oxford on the 4th of october mm-hmm um, O2 Academy Bristol on the 11th and then London at the Troxy on 12th on the 12th of next month um, nice. should be great got like Aziza J Catching Cairo Gardner Dawn Penn Solo Banton Warrior Queen and London we've got loads of um, very very special guests that we're going to announce in like, phase 2 of the lineup. some very big artists that are going to be jumping on for some special features to end the tour nice. um, so that's coming up and then what else have I got going on I think that's well, it I, that's great thank yeah. you I, I meant it's like safe events for like, oh safe folk. events so there's a really or, or good promoters. sorry I just went straight that's in right. with the no, shameless wait. promo there please please promote, um, promote it so there there's a really good brand in London called He She They um, and I've seen some great clips from the yeah. events and it's very I guess it's quite political in the way that they kind of post um, but uh, I wouldn't necessarily say that it's a political like a political group per se mm. like it's not like a political media page mm. but they're regularly sharing posts about you know sexual harassment sexual assault um, about how keeping yourself safe um, trans issues um, issues within the LGBT plus community um, it's a really good page and they throw some kick ass nights I think they had a he she they take over at Lost Village this year and I had two of the drag queens on with me um and on my stage just wonderful human beings man and just so much fun to be around but but i think that's how people kind of describe drag queens quite a lot so oh, they're really fun but there is a person behind kind of all the makeup and stuff mm -hmm. so it was quite interesting to have a conversation with them on quite a personal level like you know they're all completely i think they're in like a witch uh costume 
Um, but you know, we having like proper talks about like their life. Yeah, someone. it was it's it. And I kept like, kept, like be you know, <laughs> she'd been like, oh, well, yeah. But it was yeah, and they're out of character, but they're still in makeup. Must yeah, be a weird. That's story. it. Um, and then there's a few. There's Fist Bristol, I think it's called. Um, and that's a very LGBT night. There's a night run by my friend Liam. Oh, he's gonna kill me for this. I can't remember what his name, what the name of his brand is. Bitch Please is called. So Bitch Please is a really good. I've show. seen that. They got their logos like a hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like um, so they they they're great. Liam's a really good friend of mine, like a lovely human being, um, and they run very queer focused nights um, and do a really good job of kind of getting that stuff communicated to the venues, to its security, putting. Um, kind of like welfare people in there as well. So people with like tabards or tabards, like an old man, like, you know, high vis stuff that like, if you're having a problem, you can go and have a conversation mm. with them. Um, and there's a few, there's a few other nights in, in Bristol that are very good for um, leading the charge on like, it's a queer space. It's for mm. queer people. Um, and this is, if you, however you want to identify, you can come here and you'll be made to feel safe. Mm. So yeah, those are kind of the top, ones I've, I can remember off the top of my head. That's good. Well, get down to those events. Get down to those, want yeah, to support. Space. And they're all grassroots as well. Mm. They're not massive companies. The only way that they can keep going is if you buy tickets. So if you can, if you can afford it, buy those tickets because we need spaces like this. We need to be, have places where we can go to feel seen and that we can enjoy mm -hmm. the company of others who we can relate to. Mm. And get down to your events. Mm. <laughs> of course. Shamelessly went straight in with my Mungus Hi-Fi tour. It's not very That's good, is right. it? Well, they're obviously safe spaces as well. So they I are very safe spaces. The question. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And then before we wrap up this this topic, um, when you book in MCs, mm. um, like a lot of the lyrics are, um, you know, quite misogynistic maybe yeah. or um, homophobic maybe. Mm. Um, how do you kind of book an MC knowing that they're, not gonna like say things. Just don't book Mr. Traumatic. <laughs> He's a fucking bell end. Yeah. Oh, you heard it here first. Traumatic, you're a bell end. Um, he's just a misogynistic piece of shit and you know, I think it's funny when you're eighteen and you've mm. got that song with Devil Man, whatever it is, and it's like, you know, I'm not even gonna say the lyrics because they're just awful, but you know, I think if you open your eyes and like think about the things that you're saying, it's just awful. Mm. Like it's so bad. He made a com he made a tweet. Oh god, was it over COVID? And he was like, um, people are too ashamed to call batty men what they are um, because they're scared that. of the backlash, faggots, something like that. And, you know, I hate that word, absolutely hate it. But And now he's back on the scene doing shows. And I emailed the venues to be like, you know, this is the guy who did this, read my emails, didn't reply, sent multiple follow-ups, spoke to someone on the phone, this is a venue in Birmingham and another one up in um, Lee or Sheffield, maybe. Just were like, well you know, he's just an artist. And so I know he's not just an artist. Like mm. he's holding a space where lots of young people are listening to him. Same with like Andrew Tate. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly the same process. It's lots of young men listening to someone that holds that space and he's misogynistic. He's homophobic. He's transphobic. Um, he's a bit of a tinfoil hat guy yeah, as well. Ideologies. It's just, it's just awful. And he's just convincing young men that it's okay to say that kind of stuff. And it's just not, it really just isn't. Like we're in 2024, man, like get a fucking grip. Mm. Um, but you know, there are MCs, I think when you're digging to find MCs, you kind of need to, same with, same with DJs, there's not any difference really when it comes to their character and their reputation. You have a look at their social media, um, you kind of look through the stuff that they're saying, you talk to your promoter friends, talk to other pals. Um, Cause when you're in that circle, when you've been doing it for so long, someone will know something. Yeah. Um, but you know, I think, and Richard, Richard Twaits, uh, Vision Obi, um, made a post the other day, maybe even today about, um, how MCs are a little bit neglected, um, that they're kind of, they play second fiddle to the DJ. And I think that he was like, it was really nice for a promoter to ask what DJ I would like to play with as opposed to, you know, what MC the DJ should want mm. to play with. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, I think it's just about, um, just, just being on it with social media, not booking bell ends, like mr traumatic yeah. and and stuff like that just using your um u using your brain to do that research mm -hmm. like same with lots of mc baseman right now yeah, um and it's just when people are problematic there's there's things happening for a particular reason and there's so many mcs both grassroots and well established that you can be going for you just don't have to go for you know people like that you just don't have to um they've a lot of them been doing this for 20 30 years like you know they've done their career or their career is still ongoing but 
you know, there's plenty of people for you to be booking. So, mm -hmm. and if you can't find an MC um, because you're like, well, there's none available, then you're not doing your job properly, in my mm -hmm. opinion. Um, but yeah, it's on you as a promoter to be doing that research um, and to be speaking with other industry pals to be like, is this person a good booking? Mm -hmm. What do you think for this? Will they blend well with this? And treating them with the same level of respect that you treat your DJs as well, because mm -hmm. MCs often get neglected. Yeah, yeah, they do. Uh, I think as well, like if they... When you're younger, like Mr. Tormatic, you used to listen to them and you think, oh, he's just he's just saying this because mm. it gets attention. Mm. As you grow up, you realize that um, if they're saying it, then they mean it probably. Yeah. Like 95% of the time. Like when MC Baseman stuff came out, everyone mm. was like, well, I suppose that makes sense because just read his lyrics and he literally yeah. is like admitting to all of these things that people are saying he's done yeah. in every single bar, basically. I mean, like even like wider in the industry, like a lot of these people have a history of mm. stuff. Like... I didn't. I haven't read too much into the MC Baseman stuff because I saw it all blow up on social media. Um, but you know, there's there's a lot of talk that people know who these people are in the industry. Like um, even massive headliners who people like they have done shit that people just don't um, know about, or like people know that they've done it, but they're such a big headliner you just don't call it out and stuff. Like it's rife in the music industry. It's mm -hmm. absolutely rife. But I guess as like a low-level promoter or someone who's starting to occupy a space because I've just been in the industry for so long. I've still got, hopefully, got a long way to go still. And I know that I do myself to, I'm still learning so much. But I guess in my space, I only want to work with people that I know. Mm. Um, people, like, I, I don't want to work with basically people who've got a reputation of that kind of stuff. Or if I'm if I'm managing a show for somebody else, like I'm there to help create a safe space for people, like for young women, for young men, young people in general, however you identify, like you should be able to be in a space where you feel heard and, and felt seen Definitely. and stuff. So I guess it's kind of like a group effort to make sure that, that even if it is a headliner who's playing is notorious for X, Y, Z, they shouldn't be getting booked in the first place. Absolutely. But you can do all in your power to make sure that the people who are in their periphery are kept safe yeah for sure you know like young girls being like young women being um you know asked to come back to the dressing room and stuff and it's like no like you're not going back sorry but i've got a curfew on the dressing room no we can go back and stuff like you won't be having the tour manager kicking scream like no no no, they should be able to come back and it's like no they're young people like you know not in my venue if you want to do it elsewhere then i can't control that but yeah so not as glamorous as people might think this industry is a bit uh it has it has its dark sides to it for sure for sure I think as well with the rise and continuing um, expansion on diversity in the dance music mm. scene, hopefully, like we're already seeing more women and gay DJs. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, we'll start seeing more female and or women and um, queer and trans MCs as well. Yeah, yeah, which yeah. Would, um, be great because I don't think I've ever seen um, an openly gay MC live, uh, especially at like a drum and bass rave. Oh, yeah. I might have, but I didn't know about it. Yeah, it's, it's a good point actually. I mean. Maybe because I'm just in here with what I do in the podcast and um, I, just, I can't remember it like kind of on the spot. But yeah, it's a good point. I don't think I really know that many openly gay male MCs. Mm. I've definitely met some some yeah, yeah. Some, like, openly gay female MCs for sure. Mm. Um, but yeah, and trans MCs as well, I guess within drum and bass. Like I've not, I've not, yeah, it's a really good point. It's a really good they point. They are about it. I'm, sure, I'm absolutely TikTok certain they're about. I'm they, sure they that I just, in and yeah, I just sure I haven't done the, the right feature. research and stuff. So something for me to look into, but I'm absolutely sure that they exist. Like that'd be a great night. Yeah, I think it is. But again, like if you ever see a show with an orthodox, um, mm. definitely go to one of those shows. It's a very pro queer space. Great drum and bass, great DJs, great performers like Nathan Book, Toby, sorry, Books. Um, his artist name is Nathan X. Um, Toby Books, amazing like live performers and this creates a really, really good space for it. So if you see an unorthodox night, go go for it. And if you're not queer, of course, that's still fine. Mm -hmm. But remember that it's a space for queer people. You know, you don't, you, that's not a space for you to occupy, mm. you know, and support your queer friends, support your trans friends, you know, like we need it. <laughs> we need some support. Yeah. <laughs> Good stuff. Well, it's time on that note for a penguin. Nice. The oven is still broken, unfortunately. What happened so, to the oven? Uh, it just didn't turn on one day. Oh, really? And it's like, okay, that's good. Have you got a joke on there for me? I do. Okay, yeah, go gosh. So, why was the penguin's head so cold? <laughs> um, why was the penguin's head so cold? Because he was wearing an ice cap. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Boo. <laughs> How do penguins get around? A bicycle. 
Yes, on yeah. a bicycle. On a bicycle. Bi- bi- a bicycle. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking yesterday, do you think they employ someone to write these jokes or do you think they're getting like AI to do them? Mm, really good question. I reckon they used to employ someone and then AI is take, taken over. Because mm. you never get two in the same pack with the same joke either. Mm. There must be some like a big system in place. There it. must be. I've never really thought about that actually. How do you avoid things like that happening? I don't know. Hello. Cheers. Cheers. Mm. Oh yeah, good stuff. I've been a penguin for so long. Yeah, we've talked for forty-five minutes now about um, basically drum and bass, yeah. um, which is great. But what what else does Max Scott do? Mm. I've got into climbing recently. Yeah, it feels like it's a cult, though climbing. <laughs> it's such a cult. But once you do it a few times, you build up your confidence. It's so much fun. Um, what else do I do? Big film lover. Go to the cinema. Yeah. I got a membership for Everyman Cinema. Oh wow! I fancy. Know. Very fancy. Too, um, much, too much money in drum and bass. So I've seen. <laughs> I must have seen the best part of like twenty films in the cinema this year. Wow. Maybe twenty five. Um, me and my housemate Rory, shout out Rory, best mate. Um, we he's not really watched many films. Um, he didn't really watch many as a kid, um, or at least missed a lot of the classics. So we've been going back and watching classic TV series. So we're on the Sopranos right nice. now. Nice. Okay. It's the first time I've ever seen the Sopranos, and every time I speak to someone who has seen it, they're like, "It is the best TV series ever." Um, so Never I'm like it. living my life of, um, you know, in real time of brand new, all of it's new to me, which mm. is good. Um, I've been watching like classic, like Tarantino films, or watching like classic James Cameron films, Steven Spielberg, um, and like rewatching all the Terminator franchise as well, mm. which has been great. Um, but yeah, big film guy, a big TV guy in general. Um, what else do I do? I don't really know. I mean, climbing is, is definitely a cult. Oh yeah, w- without a doubt. It's such a weird. Without um, a doubt. I mean, it's not weird. It's great, and uh, it's glad that people are doing exercise. Um, anything to get people active is great, but it's it is quite strange. Like I saw a video. It was a bit of a skit yesterday, and it was a guy explaining like, "Oh, so what you need to do? You need to go from this point, and you need to climb up to this point." And it, um, this is more bouldering, but and yeah. the guy just stood up and said, well, "Well, why? Because if I just stand up, I could just reach that spot anyway." Yeah. And he was like, "Oh yeah, that's, what, yeah. Why am I? Why are we doing this? Because it's fun. It's fun. Yeah, it's good fun. Um, but yeah, I went with my friend Jacob recently. Jacob's a very good climber. Um, I went like bouldering, and um, I think the max I've got up to so far is V two slash V three. I think the highest it goes up to is like seventeen. So just seventeen, not like V seventeen. I'm not actually too sure how the scaling works, but maybe it goes up to V's and then goes down to zero and then upwards or whatever. But 17s are like the proper like free climbing ones mm. where you're like, you know, like upside down vertical yeah. cliffs and stuff <laughs> like that, with, which haven't been climbed before. Um, and um, yeah, it's good. It's really good fun, but it's always funny because I'm not the best climber. I just haven't done it enough. Um, and you'd be stuck on one and you're like, oh, like, you know, you keep like kind of falling off or you kind of give up because you've lost your confidence and you don't want to like hurt yourself. Mm-hmm. And then you'll stand back and be listening, to, like watching it. And then someone will just come on and do the whole thing like a cat. And you're like, mm-hmm. for God's sake, man, they'll do it in like two seconds. And you're like, cool. And you're like, yeah, well done, mate. Fuck off. Like, that's you know, so <laughs> what I'm like. Um, and, uh, but no, I, I'm really enjoying it at the moment. It's good for the headspace. Mm-hmm. I think going into autumn, I guess like for a lot of people, the mental health kind of, mm-hmm differs and dips yeah, a little absolutely. bit absolutely like you're not kind of in that vitamin c rich or vitamin d vitamin c for, for uh, the sun? d v- i think vitamin d rich atmosphere um so like a bit of a bad mental health day yesterday um and then went for a run for like i ran for like six miles i think yesterday nice. so the exercise has been a big help it like does. i usually would just fester at home and mm. Pretty good to the pub, but I'm not drinking at the moment. I've been nice. Yeah, well I'm done. stopping drinking, which is good. Um, until Christmas, um, some more exercise. Yeah, it's going going good. Good stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's great. I've been doing. Um, I'm sure everyone on the podcast has fed up with me saying this, but triathlon, um, training, and I just did my first one. On mm, the how's that going? Um, it was really good. Um, and exactly that, like, just makes me feel good, you mm. know. And a lot of the time, if I've got like, oh, I gotta go for a run today. I can't, I can't be bothered. Mm. As soon as you get out there. It's like, oh, I feel better immediately. Yeah. As soon as you just get in that fresh air, you get some sunlight, mm. get some blood pumping, mm. um, you feel better. And I guess climbing is um, unique in that um, if you fuck up, you could die. So yeah, to, I think if you, you fuck up real bad, like if you go to I mean, like a bowling place. Yeah, like, I mean, you know, they do say you have to do like a training, like an induction thing when you first join. Mm. Um, and, you know, the crash mats aren't 
um they're not like the ones you used to get in primary school that are basically like a cinder block yeah. <laughs> but they're also there to help like stop your fall or to like take the impact but they're not soft mm. so if you fall the wrong way you can definitely break a limb and mm. people often do um so you do need to err on the side of caution i guess but um but it's a very supportive atmosphere as well people really want you to mm. succeed and what me and my housemate do i've got like slaying the dragon so to go in you're trying a few ones uh that you kind of see you warm up a little bit and if there's one that you're really struggling on mm. you know keep going around and doing other ones and then come back and try and slay that one before the end mm. of your session um and then once you if you like slay it it's just such a high for it like you're like yes i did it let's go home now let's go drink a beer. <laughs> um but yeah i experienced runner's high for the first time pretty recently yeah and it was like it was like taking drugs not that i've ever taken drugs but it, I could, it was imagine why well, i imagine it's like to you know <laughs> <laughs> sure. i've never ever taken drugs in my life um and uh yeah i was like Dude, this feels incredible. And like I had Bonobo on in my earphones, oh, like listening to his Black Sands album. And I was just like, it was my favorite album of all time. And I was like, oh yeah, this feels great. And then got home and was like, my legs. Yeah, it's like <laughs> that guy in um, SpongeBob. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, my legs. <laughs> um, my diet doctor kelp. <laughs> a, a guy I work with, he's um, a power athlete. Um, he's missing the bottom half of his left arm. Yeah. Uh, and he's in Team GB for power climbing mm. um and he does loads of competitions he's really um cool i'd love to get him on here actually that'd be um, great and he says it's interesting when he goes to competitions because in climbing uh in competitions the people get together before it starts and they discuss like how maybe they you could get up the wall because mm -hmm. they're really hard at comp so it's not like you you it's good to help each other because just because you all go the same route it doesn't mean you're all gonna get up yeah there. um but he said at their competitions you can't really do that because he's missing half his left arm someone else is <laughs> missing half their right yeah. leg um so it's like well yeah i'm gonna go that way but i think you're probably gonna I think you might be better way. going that way yeah yeah but i think that's still one, that, like, that, that camaraderie, that camaraderie. Yeah, yeah, yeah i think that's it and why i've been really enjoying it like i can't say you know i've, I've been going for a couple of months now um and but people actively want you to do good and like mm. you know random strangers will come up and be like oh maybe try Try using this to lift up your right leg instead of your left because your right seems to be stronger. Mm. And then just go for that climb. And I get that confidence to just grab it. And then when you do, and everyone's yeah. like clapping, or people are like, oh, <laughs> people spudge you more. It's not like an applause. People are like, oh, well done, bro. Yeah, you smashed it. Like, it's a, it's a really good feeling. Um, and I think it's definitely one of the funner sports because it is quite a solo sport, I guess. I guess there maybe is like a, an element to it where other people are involved but you know it's you it's you that's climbing it's you that has your own confidence and your own kind of like threshold to like push through prior to that i used to fish for years fishing i used to course really? i was a i just got a semi-professional fisherman for years really? i went international i, I won international competitions competitions around the uk wow. i was part of a anglers club called the glamorgan anglers right nice <laughs> i don't think i've ever talked about this with anybody um but uh How yeah how does fishing competition work it's not a timed is it it's timed and then timed. so i used to do 24 and 48 hour competitions so oh, basically okay. be how much that you can catch within that allotted time frame wow. um and yeah it's tough man and it's an expensive sport and as someone who comes from a working class family mm. i had to work my <laughs> ass off as like a 12 year old in the bloody butcher's van trying to you know or 13 year old in the, in the greasy spoon Stealing washing bits dishes. of chicken for you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to get my paycheck and go straight to the tackle shop and like buying some new line or and i spent hours watching tv of like these um uh, Robson Green. Robson Green? Yeah, Matt, uh, what was his name? Matt something. Um, he was like a really famous um, uh, Geordie, um, Geordie angler. <laughs> I love those are going, yeah, yeah, I'm going to do this. And um, yeah, I just sat out for hours watching people fish and talk about the new equipment. And mm. and I think it was called Tackle Line or something like that. Oh, oh, so I can't remember. It was years ago. But yeah, that was kind of like my main thing for years. Wow. Yeah, lost all social cues. <laughs> <laughs> for years, I just sat there like, you know, staying at the lake. Yeah, yeah. it's always um, fascinated me that it's quite it's quite popular um, mm. with people that you wouldn't expect it to be popular with. Like I had some friends that used to go, and I think they just used to go because they could go and sit by a lake all day smoking weed mm. and occasionally having to pick up the line and catch a fish. Yeah. And it was just relaxing, they said. Yeah. Oh, I was time. a serious fisherman. I'm a, <laughs> I, I, so many, I would describe myself as quite fun, but 
I just have this thing in my brain where when I'm doing something, it's like really serious and really like, you know, this is how it needs to be done. We need to do it this way. And I'm really like, meh, 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 meh. so I don't think I would be a joy to go fishing with. I think that's probably why I was so <laughs> solo. I used to go, actually, I used to have an ex-girlfriend years ago. So a girl who went to Stanwell, our secondary school that we used to go to for the viewers, for the listeners yeah, at home. Listeners. Um, and um, I used to go fishing with her and her dad. Um, wow. Yeah. And then I remember... <laughs> There's a thing called a bivy, which is basically like a tent, effectively, but in the in the anglers' world, it's called a bivy. And um, uh, we were doing like a 48 hour competition on the Kef and Mabley Lakes, I think it was. And um, uh, and I was in my bivy, and they given me this kind of like gas lamp, and <laughs> we were like fishing. I went into the I went into my bivy and put this lamp on, and all they could see was a like the outline of me really clearly just like flicking through this magazine I think it was like a fashion magazine or something and I was just there with my girlfriend and I was like in my head I was like I I am gay like <laughs> but I just don't have I just can't tell her mm. I can't accept it to myself but I was there like too but I used to love fishing I used to absolutely love it I was mad about it um but kind of grew out of it a little bit like I go very rarely these days mm. but um yeah it's good good fun too. yeah mind every now and then yeah that's it so that's that's kind of me really nice. like films climbing yeah so you're not you're not a gold star gold star yeah in what uh being gay uh, that, <laughs> oh no i've only heard it from i think no i think but... a gold star is you not having sex with women i think that's what a gold star is yeah. so yeah <laughs> so I'm a gold star. <laughs> you are a gold star. Right, okay. I guess you were, yeah, you were 12 probably. Yeah, time, so yeah, exactly. Yeah, I came out when I was like 13. Lake, so, yeah. yeah. So, I think a gold star wow, is like is someone who's a gay, a gay. I don't know if it's specific to gay men. Maybe it is. I'm not sure. But it's like you've not had sex with, 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 the, the, with, with the opposite sex. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So. Interesting. Well, well done. <laughs> Thanks, If man. I had the sticker, I would give it to you. <laughs> if I had it, I would have pulled out that a gold star. That should be your next like, tattoo. Yeah, just get a gold <laughs> sticker. Yeah, yeah. Nice. nice. Big up. Okay, well, um, on that note, let's wrap it up. Before yeah. we do, um, yeah, you've, I mean, you've promoted some stuff already, but Ooh. anything you want to say, get off your chest, ask me, promote anything? Um, how's life? Like, how's everything with you? It's like, all good? Yeah. All fun? It's good. Yeah. yeah. How's your girlfriend? It's good. She's yeah. good. Yeah, she's working away in there now. We both work from home. We love a working girl. Yeah. Jobs. Yeah. yeah. It's going well. Um, Strong, independent woman. We love to see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Um, but no, I think I think that's pretty much it. I guess um, buy tickets to grassroots shows. Mm. If you see your friends who are running shows or you've got friends who are promoters or you've got artists, your friends who are artists who are just starting to get their stuff out, buy their content. Mm buy into what they're doing support them music. with a share buy their music and you know we're living across a living crisis and I don't think it's unfair to be like the only way to support people is by buying their music it's not that but you know say oh like I'm really short of cash at the moment but I'd love to be there to support can I share it in some way do you need some help flyering can I put a poster up anywhere is mm. there anything that I can do to help you like doing this as well like people do this because they love it but I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing without the support of other people. Um, and that wasn't just through people buying my tickets. It was through friends, talking to other friends to get them to buy tickets or to, you know, to help me work on the door um, for free. And they were like, all I want to do is just come in. So I'll spend an hour with you in the box office. Don't pay me. Just give me a beer and go and stuff. Just find out how you can help your promoter friends, your grassroots artist friends, your friends who are MCs. Um, focus on your queer nights. Focus on your nights that are LGBT centric. Um, and just be a person who cares really because you know we do it for the love of it we don't really make that much money mm -hmm. oftentimes we lose a lot of money but we do it because we love it so if you enjoy what we're doing or what your friends are doing buy into it in whatever capacity that you can to support that's what i'd say that's really good advice thanks thank you max scott thank you very this much it's been the Cotch podcast peace